Now, in the spring of 1862, Lincoln had sent to Congress his a plan of emancipation. Remember, he had talked to Delaware about this in uh, November 1861. Now he brings it to Congress for all the border states and any Confederate states that want to join up. It's still the same plan. Gradual emancipation, monetary compensation to the owners, colonization of the former slaves outside of the country. He asked for constitutional amendments to allow the government to do these things, which many people would think are beyond the capacity of the government under the old Constitution. Um, so his, you know, he's still pushing this idea of colonization all through 1862. And indeed, as I talk about in my book, at the very end of 1862, he signs a contract with a kind of shady adventurer called Bernard Koch, no relation to Edward Koch, the former mayor of New York, as far as I'm aware. But uh, Koch had gotten a grant of land to build um, on, on an island off of Haiti, Ile à Vache, which means island of the cows, right? If you know your French. Cow island, an uninhabited island off of Haiti. And Lincoln, on the day before the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, on December 31st, 1862, signed a contract with Koch where the government would pay him for bringing 5,000 African Americans freed people to settle on Il Avash. And he was going to provide housing and medical care and jobs and wages and all this. Um, and only about 500 were actually sent. And the whole thing was a complete disaster. Koch was a charlatan. There were no houses. There were no jobs. There was nothing. And, and uh, it, it was a dense forest. It was not cleared land. And eventually, uh, about a year or so later, Lincoln had to send naval warships to rescue these poor people who had survived and bring them back to the United States. So on the one hand, that's all that happened with colonization. 500 souls sent to Il Avash and then came back, the, the ones who survived. So some people say, well, obviously Lincoln didn't really believe in colonization because he talked a lot about it, but this is the only thing that happened. On the other hand, he did talk a lot about it, and I think you have to take Lincoln at his word in 1862 that he thought this was part of a plan of emancipation. Well, while Lincoln is doing this, Congress is moving forward on its own uh, initiative. Even though the, Repub the Republicans control Congress, it's not like today where the President and Congress, or at least the House, are at odds politically. The Republicans control Congress. Um, Congress is moving forward. They abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. in the spring of 18. 62. That had been the first demand of the radical abolitionist movement in the 1830s, because everyone knew Washington was under the control of the federal government. That's what it says. So they, they could. They can't abolish it in a state exactly, but they can abolish it in Washington, D.C., and they do. This was the first law in American history to grant freedom to any slaves. So it's an important turning point in American <coughs> jurisprudence, but it's coupled with compensation. The owners in Washington got money, about $300 it averaged out per slave. It's a very funny, in a way, or strange thing that the loyal owners, loyal owners would get compensation. If you were Confederate, you wouldn't get compensation. How do you know if an owner is loyal to, they all said, yeah, yeah, I'm loyal to the Union, give me my money. But, um, how do you know? They set up a commission. It wasn't a judge. It was a commission set up by the Congress to adjudicate these claims. So who did they ask whether the, whether the owner is pro-union or not? They asked their slaves. They're the ones who heard what these guys are saying. They're the ones who said, well, I know when uh, Stonewall Jackson won that battle, my, my owner opened a big bottle of champagne, so, you know. Um, African Americans were not allowed to testify in court against white people. But here they are testifying before a commission determining whether their owner is going to get money or not for their emancipation. So it's a very strange and interesting procedure. Um, but it's a good indication of how things are changing. They're changing at all sorts of levels, even on this level of black testimony being allowed. 
something unknown in most parts of the country before the Civil War, blacks testifying against white people. But here it's happening right in Washington, D.C. Then uh, slavery is abolished in the territories. There wasn't much slavery in the territories, and this, of course, was the Republican Party's platform before the Civil War. In the territories, there's no compensation. Oh, by the way, I should step back. The Washington, D.C. bill also includes money for colonization, voluntary. Any of these freed slaves in Washington who wish to go to Haiti or Central America, the government will pay to send them. But nobody wanted to go. None of them signed up to go from Washington, even though, so it's, it's still this plan of, of, of compensation, colonization. Abolition in the territories, which only affected a handful of people, not, there there was no compensation because the position of the Republican Party, remember, had been freedom national. There should not be any slavery in the territories, and therefore there was, it was illegal and there was nothing to compensate out there. Uh, then a bill was passed prohibiting the army from returning fugitive slaves. The fugitive slave law remains on the books. It's not repealed until 1864. Oddly enough, it's not enforced anymore in the North, and now the army is not allowed to enforce the idea of returning fugitives to slavery. Um, and then finally in July, very important but very little known law, the second Confiscation Act. Remember the first Confiscation Act had said any slave working in a military capacity who gets to Union lines will be free. Now, any slave of a rebel any slave of a rebel who comes within Union lines will be free. Doesn't matter if they're working on military things at all. As the Union Army moves forward, any slaves that come within its boundaries will become free under the, under the Second Confiscation Act if the owner is a rebel. Now, they, you know, if the owner could prove he was pro-Union, that's that, but there weren't uh, that many of those. So if the war had gone on without the Emancipation Proclamation, many, many slaves would have become free under the Second Confiscation Act. It certainly shows how Congress is now moving rapidly in the direction of emancipation. So Lincoln is totally aware of all this, obviously. He signs every single one of these bills. Um, when did Lincoln decide upon emancipation? Well, there's all sorts of debate about that. It's kind of boring debate. I won't go into it. The only the, the best evidence we have is Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, records in his diary, well actually I shouldn't say, Gideon Wells' diary, which is a document we all use, isn't really a diary. <laughs> it was written after the war and then retrospectively given dates. So that's not a diary. But, on, but he did include for July 13th, 1862, he says, He's in a carriage with Lincoln going to a funeral for Stanton's child who had died, and Lincoln broaches the point that he's readying a proclamation of general emancipation. Now, is this valid? Well, it is, because the same day that contemporaneously, Wells wrote a letter to his wife saying this had happened. So his diary entry retrospectively written later was correct because at the time he wrote this letter to his wife. Um, and he says, I, this is such a profound thing, I can't even begin to think about what the consequences will be. So that's July 13th. Nine days later, July 22nd, Lincoln broaches this to his cabinet. And what's interesting is, it's within the context of changing the way the war is being fought. The, he talks about a series of orders. One of them is allowing the army to live off the land allowing the Union Army to just seize property, crops, animals, whatever, from civilians, obviously, in order to live in this, you know, off the land in the South. This changes how the war is, going to be, is being fought. Right now, civilian property is going to become a target of the war effort. You know? So that we don't need to be shipping things uh, all the way from the North. We will just take. We're there In Virginia, there's vast very fertile area in the Shenandoah Valley, et cetera. So that's one. This is a shift in the war toward total war. And along with it is this 
just a one or two sentence note by Lincoln saying, and by the way, after a certain date, all slaves in the rebel states will be free. The cabinet is stunned. This is far more than anyone in the cabinet has actually proposed, and it is far more than Congress has proposed, because it makes no distinction between loyal owners and rebel, disloyal owners. All the slaves will be declared free, no matter who their owners are. The cabinet discusses this, and Secretary of State Seward says, um, you know, uh, this is all right, I guess. Uh, he's not too enthused, but um, you cannot issue it now. It will seem like an act of desperation. You must wait until a military victory to issue this proclamation, because it'll look now like the last, the last card of a gambler who's losing. You play your final card. That is not the way you want this to be viewed by the world. Um, so Lincoln says, all right, all right, good point. I'm going to wait. And he files it away. This is July. Files it away waiting for a military victory.